So let me um, introduce myself. We are now having the 15th World Ocean Forum, and I'd like to thank you very much for your participation. We do have really renowned uh, speakers today, and I was so busy writing all the memos uh, because I really enjoyed the lecture. So my name is Kim Hyun Gyam. So I have been in this forum for four years now. I have met a lot of venerable scholars and also speakers all around the world. I actually see a lot of familiar faces who actually turned up last year as well. Professor Mao again. When we first invited him, he was in the US, but now he moved to Cambridge, the UK. And next to me is the ambassador, Yensen. And we actually personally visited him to invite him as a speaker for today's forum. And Professor uh, Maurigian, he came all the way to Korea to honor us with his presence, but I heard that he actually had some inconvenience on his way. So maybe later he can share that as well. So because of the COVID-19, last year we had the hybrid forum and all the foreign speakers joined us online. But today I'm very honored that and thrilled that we have uh, this offline presence of these uh, renowned foreign uh, uh, speakers. So countries around the world are now launching a new transition to a new COVID strategy, focusing on learning to live with COVID-19, so the so-called with corona strategy. But still, we cannot have, we cannot afford to have 100% on-site uh, forum. And in fact, a lot of people signed up for today's forum during the pre-registration phase. So we couldn't really have 100% offline event, though a lot of people wanted to participate in today's forum offline. We could not invite them, accommodate them all. So I'm sorry for that. As I said, this year might the 15th World Ocean Forum. And in fact, we spent one year to prepare for the forum every year. So last year, after the 14th forum, we thought about what kind of forum we are going to have for 2021 because it marks the 15th and 15 is very special number in Korea, in Korean culture. And at the time, someone um, talked about Professor Mauragian and his book, 2030. So the members of the organizing committee was impressed by his book and we contacted him and he uh, accepted our offer and we are very grateful for that. So why don't you give him another round of applause for his generosity. Thank you very much. And also the Amu Jong, Secretary General of Asia Development Bank, he gave us the video presentation. If it could happen with us, that might have been better, but um, he asked for our understanding for his absence. So now we are going to have discussion with these two uh, key figures. Some people call the World Ocean Forum, which is now being hosted in Busan City, and they call World Ocean Forum Davos Forum of the maritime sector. And uh, I'm very delighted to hear um, such a uh, name and also such a good response. Now, we would like to have discussion with Professor Gian and Ambassador 
I know the answer, and so we will begin the discussion now. Uh, we are collecting questions from the floor and also from YouTube and online. So for the participants on site, if you do have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. And for our online participants, please type in your question in the chat box. So And also please leave your comments as well. While we are collecting questions from online, we are going to collect questions from the floor. But before that, I'd like to make some comments and ask a question. Because we have a world-renowned scholar as well as the ambassador. And in fact, we had the video presentation by um, Amu Jong was there. And in fact, there was an overarching theme among the three presentations, which is to take action right now, take action now. Otherwise, it will be too late. Uh, so, so the Secretary General Om and also the Professor Mara Gien, I think they all gave me the same message that we have to take action, we have to act now. And also Ambassador Aina Jensen, concluded his presentation with the same message that we have to move fast and we have to act now. We are living in an era of digital transformation. And in fact, the World Ocean Forum is also on inflection point as it marked the 15th. So although we may not be perfect, but we have to take action now. And regarding this topic, we would like to have discussion. So rather than me talking and talking, because we have many great participants today, I would like to open the floor for Q&A and discussion session. So if you do have any question, please raise your hand. So we have one person at the back. I think he's the member of city council. So please hand the microphone over to her. Very nice to meet you. My question is to, to the ambassador. So you said that the uh, local resident of the SB report, uh, they actually embrace the offshore wind. We actually have the problems of the opposition from local residents. And you, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, you're going to talk about how to buy in the public acceptance for the establishment of offshore wind. So I would like to ask that question. In fact, we are experiencing the same problem that the uh, local uh, citizens and residents, they are very negative about offshore wind. We are trying to build the offshore wind in Kijang of Busan. Uh, and they, the local residents, they are concerned about the negative impacts from the offshore wind. And they believe that it has negative impact on the marine ecosystem and this will also disturb their living and their occupation. So can you please talk about how to create the public acceptance for offshore wind? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think it's a question that is asked very often uh, that we get. And uh, in Denmark, we had the first offshore wind uh, park put up 30 years ago. So over these 30 years, we have gained uh, quite a bit of experience and the world has developed in the meantime also. As I said before, when I was a boy, there was eight to 900 fishermen in that port of Isberg. And how many do you think is left today? Three. The boats have become bigger, <clears throat> they go further to sea, they do the catch there, and um, it, some of them have also maybe moved to other uh, harbors than this one. But development has showed that, you know, fishing takes big, uh, take place on a big scale, and it's, uh, not, a, it's not a dying, you know, job situation, because there will still be fishermen. Uh, we also found in Denmark that uh, fish actually still like to be around wind turbines. If you have a certain si uh, distance between the turbines, you can do fishing in between them. It's not a problem. In the newest offshore wind parks in the US, they plan for a certain size to allow for fishermen to take their boats through and do the catch uh, of fish every day. But I think what has really made the change in, in uh, Isbeck Port is that all the fishermen starting to lose jobs uh, found new jobs first in the oil and gas industry, and later on now in the offshore wind. 
uh, because there's towers that needs to be assemblies, there's blades that needs to be pulled out and made. All that needs to go onto ships, uh, with, onto special installation vessels. Many of the fishermen are working on these installation vessels now. They simply change their job from fishermen to working on a, in another trade. And uh, so I think that that trade change has, has helped. What we do uh, and what we're also doing in Korea, we invite to dialogue today in Jinbuk province. There's a dialogue between fishermen in Jinbuk out from Gunsan and the Fisheries Association in Denmark online where they discuss and get the experience from the fishermen in Denmark. How did they see it and how what developed over time in Denmark? What kind of compensation should you be asking for? Or is a new job opportunity a compensation in itself? Uh, so I think uh, we see overwhelmingly many fishermen that got a new job, a better job with more money and a better life than before. Uh, and fish are still caught just by bigger vessels. I think that's my answer for now. And let me also say you have great opportunities for offshore wind in Busan. Definitely. The whole east coast, it will be floating uh, offshore turbines, but great potential. But you need to get the dialogue right with the people. They should not be afraid. You can take them to sea quite at a distance. They will not even notice that they are rare. Uh, you cannot see them if they're far from shore. Uh, the ambassador made such a great point here. I think the member of the city council now has a lot of food for thought. The starting point is always the, diff the most difficult. Um, the area of improvement, uh, we need some improvement as far as the Korean is concerned. But I think that's the dialogue. Among the things that the ambassador mentioned, I believe one of the points we have to uh, give a serious thought was also included. Since we have an actual example we can refer to, so now is the time for us to put that on the table and to have an agreement on the direction we can pursue as a nation as a whole. Well, I really appreciate your answer as well as the question. Is there any question to the ambassador from the floor? Well, the question was very well concrete, so I do not believe there is any question from the floor to the ambassador. Since you made a point here, so the area of collaboration with uh, between the Korean and the Danish government, I believe there is such a great opportunity for the collaboration between the two countries. Since the fossil fuel consumption was reduced to almost zero and renewable energy accounts for 100% of the energy consumption in Denmark. So I'd like to know whether there is any kind of dialogue between the Danish government and the Korean government. If there is anything you can share with us, please let us in. 네, 저희가 아주 긴밀하게 협력하고 있다는 부분을 먼저 말씀드리고 싶습니다. 한 10년 정도 저희가 긴밀하게 협력을 해 왔는 아, Department of Green Growth Institute, Global Green Growth Institute in Seoul, uh, and focus on Green Growth Alliance, the whole green technology sector, be it offshore wind, waste handling, and so on. And uh, uh, for the past few years, there's been very intensive uh, discussions and collaboration between Korea Energy Agency in Ulsan and Danish Energy Agency, because in Denmark, Danish Energy Agency has been giving the authority to do a one-stop shop. The big problem here is whenever you want to develop a wind park, where should it be? Is the fishery interest, is the tourism interest, is the oil and gas, is the minerals, is the shipping routes that needs to be lived up to? And in Denmark, <clears throat> the Danish Energy Agency simply put the maps of everything on top, minerals, shipping routes, uh, defense interest and so on, and found the spots where you can build your wind farms. <clears throat> that one-stop shop is now being looked into here in Korea as well to speed up uh, delivery of offshore wind farms. <clears throat> but I should also say we work closely or looking into hydrogen area, uh, the turbines, the towers, 
you would be amazed how much the Danish developers and companies are buying from Korea in terms of, uh, you know, uh, foundation towers, cables, parts for the turbine itself and so on. So <clears throat> I think the collaboration is ongoing from the government to government level to the private sector. And even now we, today we talk citizens, you know, where the fishermen talk to fishermen in Denmark about experience on uh, what can be done. The Danish big developers, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners and Ørsted, accounting for more than 30% of offshore wind farm development in the world. They are also active here in Korea and they are working very closely with Korean companies. So, <clears throat> you know, technology experience are transformed and we, uh, we see this as a, as a great opportunity for the future. And again, as I said before, we strongly believe that Korea has got what it takes to be number one in Asia. The supply chain you have already, take tower production, CS Wind, they used to produce nearly 20% of the towers in, in the world for turbines. Now it's more than 20 because they bought the tower factory from Vestas in US and are now also present on the US market. So you have all elements of the supply chain. And if you combine and then do it right, you can be uh, number one in Asia, if not worldwide. Thank you. Yes, there's an, there's an... Thank you, Ambassador. Because of time constraint, but I want to make some comment that the politicians, Yes, there are politicians who have short-term view and short-term interest, but there are also some people who have a long-term vision. And I believe that the offshore wind and the renewable is a must. It's a inevitable future that we must embrace. And in the sense, I think that the ambassador um, can also contribute a lot to promote partnership between Korea and Denmark. So thank you very much in advance. Um, now, Professor Maur again. We would like to. We also have some questions. Professor Gien, he's really a sought-after uh, public speaker, and I was very impressed by his lecture today. In particular, you talked about the fertility, birth rate of babies, and how it will affect the future of the world. And I was amazed by your prediction. Uh, so in a very not too distant future, you talked about the point where all the curves are connected. And I was surprised by that. And in fact, your lecture gave us a lot of food for thought for future. So regarding that, I would like to ask a few questions. And also I would like to open the floor for Q&A later. So can you put up the script? Okay, I will just read it. So I'm going to read the questions. I read your book and I actually watched a YouTube video with Google. And so in the process of rapid technological development, you somehow mentioned about the lack of solidarity among different nations. You arrived in Korea yesterday and during the Google talks, you actually said that the Korea is well, COVID is well under control in Korea. But because we do have very strict control for uh, COVID-19, it actually caused a lot of inconveniences for you. And in fact, a lot of Korean people have to bear those inconveniences as well. So regarding the solidarity and cooperation between countries and how we overcome COVID-19 as well as all these inconvenience, can you give us your comments? Yes, of course. Um, so I am very happy to be here, by the way. I mean, I, I knew that uh, there were 
um, obviously some uh, strict measures in place to um, make sure uh, that, uh, as uh, you just mentioned, uh, the uh, situation with COVID-19 doesn't uh, deteriorate uh, in, in, in South Korea and uh, many other countries in the world have similarly uh, strict measures. Um, I think, um, you know, what we're seeing with COVID-19 in terms of um, how we're dealing with the pandemic is an instance of how, uh, you know, globalization offers many, many opportunities um, to people um, but at the same time, it also creates uh, situations in which the complexity and the interactions in the world, uh, the frequent movement of people uh, become uh, an issue, uh, become, uh, in other words, a channel through which uh, disease can, can, can spread. Um, and uh, what I said at that talks at Google uh, about uh, 10 months ago or so, if I remember, is that um, in certain parts of the world, and certainly South Korea is one of them, uh, the number of uh, cases, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of fatalities has been uh, smaller than in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, in many parts of Europe, uh, definitely in the United States, uh, but also Latin America, uh, the situation has been so much uh, worse uh, in terms of those uh, three metrics of cases, hospitalizations, and uh, fatalities. And um, uh, I think um, in this part of the world, in East Asia, one of the key advantages that I think you have had um, is that, that you had to deal with a, uh, not as deadly a virus, but a still a very difficult situation with SARS uh, not so long ago. And you had created not only um, a, an infrastructure for dealing with these kinds of crises, uh, but also, um, you already knew that the population would be on your side, public opinion, which was something uh, that the Ambassador Jensen was uh, mentioning very, uh, as a very important key point in terms of uh, uh, you know, accomplishing other important goals in, in society, such as, for example, the transition to uh, green energy sources. Um, so I think that's, that's what lies behind it, right? What lies behind it is a, um, a previous experience, past experience, um, that you already have some kind of an infrastructure to deal with this kind of a crisis. And secondly, that you had a population that was far more willing to follow the, the directions of the health authorities than in other parts of the world. And, and I think, um, you know, COVID-19 at the end of the day, um, you know, we can think about it as a catastrophe. We can think about it as something that has essentially you know, being um, a, um, a misfortune for all of us. We feel perhaps that we've been unlucky because for a hundred years there was no major pandemic in the world. Uh, but I want to say something um, like a counterfactual possibility uh, that should make us feel better. Imagine, just imagine for a moment that COVID-19 had struck 20 years ago, 20 years ago, without two basic things in place. One is digital platforms that enable remote work, remote learning, and e-commerce. Imagine if this pandemic had hit us, not even 20 years, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, the consequences for the economy would have been so much more devastating. And then the other uh, really important thing, I was uh, having dinner just three days ago with um, Sarah Gilbert, who is a um, professor at Oxford University and one of the um, members of the team that came up with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And what she was telling me is that today we can come up with vaccines that are effective and safe to use within a few months. And that's exactly what has happened. But 20 years ago, that technology didn't exist either. Uh, so again, just as a, as a thought experiment, uh, just imagine if the pandemic had occurred 20 years ago, as opposed to now. We would be, I think, um, in a situation that would be more akin to what happened during the Black Death uh, 800 years ago or 700 years ago, as opposed to you know, the pandemic that, of course, has claimed many lives, but at the same time hasn't, you know, 
brought down with it the entire global economy. And if I may, on this point, um, uh, you know, the ambassador was mentioning how important it is to create an ecosystem for any big transformation. So the example that he chose is that of the uh, green energy sector in Denmark. And, and what is really key is that all of the pieces are there, right? So you have the ecosystem in place. And if other countries in the world want to succeed, then you have to recreate that ecosystem, essentially, one way or another, in collaboration, hopefully, with, uh, with Denmark. Um, but I think that's also the case with a pandemic such as COVID-19, uh, that if we, in the future, have to face another similar crisis situation such as this, um, we need to have an ecosystem in place. And that ecosystem includes everything, not just uh, the technology and the business sector and the funding available, but also government structures and public opinion as well. Uh, because I would, in closing, just uh, highlight that perhaps in many countries around the world, the biggest problem now that we have a vaccine, now that we have effective treatments, is to persuade people uh, that they should trust science. And, uh, and it is a tragedy, right? It is a tragedy that in so many parts of the world, um, a very large percentage of the population, uh, 20, even 30 percent, even in places where you know, people know that science has made those countries very rich, like in the United States or in France, where there's a similar proportion of um, vaccine uh, resistors, right, uh, who don't want to get vaccinated. Um, I think it's really important for us, once again, to realize the importance of ecosystems. And I think that also plays with the theme of this uh, forum in the sense that um, if, we, if we, we want anything to work in the world, we need to think in ecosystem terms. So that would be my response. So for about four years, I have engaged in discussion as a, a moderator. And in fact, Professor Morrigan gave us a very, very clear answer on what kind of roles we must play on this era of inflection point. Again, I have another question regarding your book. So your book, 2030, the keyword of this book, one of the keyword is lateral thinking and problem solving from lateral thinking. Uh, you talk Korea in Korea, um, equality becomes very important issue and lateral thinking I think is really a useful tool to understand Korea's social situations including population aging, urbanization and all the ensuing problems as well as advances and also the although uh, and also the blockchain um, is becoming a very important issue in our society as well and what you claim in your book is that it's not a matter of whether we want to change, whether we want to embrace, it's a matter of must. So I understand that the um, you visited Korea several times. So I want to know what Korea need to do in order to be prepared for future and what areas Korea should focus on. So can you please give us your answer? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I get this question actually um, many times. And well, number one is collaborate with Denmark on green energy. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I think that is just uh, one instance of what I think um, South Korea should do. I mean, South Korea is one of the largest economies in the world. Um, but of course, it's not large uh, relative to other uh, economies out there. And so I think um, the policy that you put in place many years ago, beginning in the 1960s, of gradually integrating South Korea into the global economy uh, was the correct one, in the sense that uh, if you open yourself up to foreign influences, if you attempt to compete as opposed to, um, you know, uh, shield yourself from global competition, that's always something that in the very long term is going to make you stronger. Um, we are in a knowledge-based economy, so investing in education, ensuring that people have access to education, equal access to education, I understand that this is perhaps uh, more of an issue here, is, uh, is really, really important. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, there's also something uh, regarding this uh, problem of uh, inequality that I think is really important. And perhaps we can also learn from the Scandinavian countries because they're also very small economies exposed to big external shocks from the global economy. And the way that over the last, um, I would say, 50 or 60 years, they have tried to compensate for those external shocks is by developing a social safety net, right? Um, so I don't think, um, you know, uh, we need to invent anything new. What I think we need to do is to implement ideas that are already um, successful in other parts of the world. Um, so South Korea has made great progress uh, over just three generations. I mean, South Korea was, you know, much poorer as a country, as an economy, than Latin America, uh, than parts of Europe, um, just uh, three generations ago. But over the course of these generations, South Korea has essentially surged ahead and now is one of the best connected economies in the world. You have uh, one of the highest um, uh, race, rates of um, smartphone usage. Uh, you have a great um, uh, internet um, infrastructure here. You have all of the ingredients to continue making progress uh, without leaving anybody behind. Now, one last comment, uh, the challenge of population aging. Uh, so this is, of course, serious. I'm, I'm very happy uh, that um, you know, the world is moving towards having fewer children because I think the pressure otherwise on natural resources would be very difficult. But of course, when you go uh, from having on average uh, three or four children per woman estimated over her lifetime down to what the figure is right now in South Korea, which is about one, right? Or even slightly less than one, right? Uh, per woman, 0 0.9. Um, that's a big change. And of course, 0 0.9 or round number one is well below the replacement level in a country with, uh, like yours with very little immigration. So unlike uh, certain countries in Europe, unlike the United States, unlike Canada, unlike Australia, you don't have at your disposal the immigration option as a way to, uh, right? Because South Korea is not prepared the same way that Japan is not prepared to have uh, a big wave of immigration. So, you're going to have to be very careful. Um, by the way, one last comment, which I think is also important, and I want to engage here in lateral thinking with uh, the, uh, another trend, which is technology. Uh, while at the same time that you have fewer babies, you also have an enormous increase in life expectancy in South Korea, right? And so people are living longer and uh, they stay healthy for a longer period, a number of years. That is to say, they stay physically and mentally fit. And therefore, they can continue working. And so I think it's really important to also provide new channels, new opportunities for people to continue working if that's what they wish to do. And my lateral thinking here has to do with technology, um, given that we are in a knowledge-based economy. Um, I thought that the so-called gig economy, when it emerged, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I thought that was going to be the province of millennials, that only millennials were going to, uh, you know, work in the gig economy. And I have to say that back then, 12 years ago, I was completely wrong. Because I think before we know it, maybe in five years from now or so, we're going to have more gig workers in the world who are above the age of 60 than gig workers who are in their 20s or in their 30s. And the basic notion here is that gig work is more flexible. Gig work allows for more flexibility. People who want to work part-time just to make an extra money to stay connected. Because remember, one of the biggest challenges in old age is social isolation, the feeling of loneliness. Um, so I see a great potential there, especially for a place like South Korea where you have perhaps the best infrastructure for gig work in the world, meaning in, in the sense of the internet. And just one last comment in this respect. You refer to the blockchain, uh, you refer to artificial intelligence. Yes, those technologies are going to displace routine cognitive workers. Right? Routine cognitive workers, not the non-routine, the more creative workers. And so that's going to have an impact everywhere in the world. So this takes us back to where you started, which is inequality. It is just a fact that every single wave of new technology 
brings benefits, but it also brings inequality. Because inevitably, some people benefit from it to a much greater extent than others. And not only that, in some cases, also the technology displaces or disrupts the livelihoods of certain groups of people. So again, going back to um, you know, the issue at the beginning, I think we have uh, so many things to learn from certain countries in the world, and one of them is to tackle inequality early on. Because if you let it spin out of control, then it becomes a very difficult issue to address. And by the way, it can give rise to political turmoil, to populism, to all of these really negative things. Well, there are so many questions why I'd like to ask. But uh, Ambassador Yansan has another matter to attend to. So before we close, um, I'd like to ask Mr. Um, Ambassador Yansan whether well, he has any question to Professor Guillen. And I'd like to ask Professor Guillen whether he has any question to uh, the ambassador. It was very well, brief and to the point. Only three minutes you have. And, and, uh, ambassador, well, do you have any question or comment to Professor Guillen? Yes, uh, certainly I have a, a comment for you because I agree very much with you, Professor, on, on uh, the fertility rate. I think the figures in Korea is now down to 0 0.86. In Denmark, we are still at 1.6. Um, uh, figures show that in 2050, there will be 23 countries that have half the, the population size. Korea will be one of them. So you will have gone from 51 million to uh, 25 uh, if development goes as it is right now. I don't think so. But seriously, you need to think about what makes your young population want to have babies. You know, what, is a, uh, what makes your society tick? What is, uh, is it a secure environment, secure job, uh, equal for women and men, you know, in terms of uh, staying in the workforce and development and so on? So that's one thing. And the other comment I have for you, uh, Professor, is that, yes, in Denmark, we looked into this problem also. Because aging population, Korea and Denmark the same with many more aging people. In Denmark, we have done away with the retirement age. It means uh, my sons who are in their 20s now, they have to work till they're 74. Uh, so we will be gradually increasing the time you have to stay uh, in the workforce because they will probably be lived till they're 90 years old. We cannot afford to have them as pensioners for 30 years. There's no way. So we need to allow people and we will be fit for that as well. I think, you know, Professor, maybe the one question I would say to you is, you know, how do we find this balance in society? What do you think uh, will give a balanced society? And if you take the example of Korea now, uh, how will they find the balance in having the right, you know, fertility rate, uh, building their cities and so on, because if they are halved in size in, in 20 or 30 years from now, uh, that will not work with big cities as well. So that would be my question to you. Yeah, and there's no uh, single answer to that. Uh, let me just answer in 20 seconds and then ask you a question. I think uh, a number of uh, policies need to be in place. Uh, and. Uh, I also believe that we need to move away from this model in which we study, then we work, we retire. Because that is really bad, especially for women, because they have, uh, you know, their biological clock coincides with the most important years if you want to get promoted at a job. So I think the solution, quite frankly, is to move away from that sequential model. So what I'm advocating for is you study, you work for 20 years, you go study again for 20 years, and that way which will last until you're 74 or 75. But I think breaking with that cycle is what, uh, in the end, would help women and uh, young couples out their fertility decisions in a different way. Very quick question, quick question in just uh, three or four words, uh, Ambassador Jensen. So I think the Nordic countries are, in so many ways, an example to imitate, right? Um, and you mentioned earlier that you decided not to do shipbuilding any longer, but just to move on. Um, so, what, um, okay. 
what, um, what do you see in Denmark's future, right? Uh, especially when it comes to showing the world the way to remain competitive. Thank you. Uh, very good question, Professor. Um, I think, you know, definitely over time we have, our wages have increased. That's why all of a sudden it was cheaper to build ships in Asia. Korea will see that uh, some of the shipbuilding will take place in China or Vietnam. So you might lose some of it. Shipbuilding goes up and down. So sometimes it's good to have another sector that can slot into them. I think our cutting edge will be uh, new technology, uh, technology side, develop the new uh, ideas. So uh, <clears throat> from the Danish side, we, have, we go all in when it comes to digital. Uh, Korea does the same. You have the Green New Deal, which is partly on focusing on green aspects. The other part is on digitalization. And uh, we are very much digitalized in Denmark. There are no more letters floating around. All is going into your mailbox. Uh, you have to direct access to all health information that is related to you. Uh, you can go to any doctor, he can pull up your health information and, and so on. So there are many advances of digitalization and so I think technology, digitalization and find some niche areas. And then the last thing I want to comment on also, Professor, as you know, we need to find that balance. We talk about the Nordic countries being the most happy. Right now, Finland is number one on the happiness index. Denmark is number two. Sweden, Norway, a bit further down, but still quite high. I think it doesn't have to do with one single factor. It has to do with lots of different things. You free healthcare, free education. I'm a farmer's son. There's no way my parents could afford to put me to university. I had, they had to pay for it. But the free education made it possible to move forward in that way. Uh, pension schemes, uh, unemployment schemes. So this social network that you talked about before, social safety, gives you also a sort of a, a balance in your society. And then the middle class, as you mentioned before, once we're all into the middle class, we all have something we care about. And, and that's a stability in a country as well. So um, now I would say technology, digitalization, and focus on these areas. And then, as I said before, <clears throat> because consumers want to be green, and we have 70% green energy now, and soon 100% green electricity, we see uh, Facebook, Google, Apple coming to Denmark, setting up data centers and so on. They want to be where you can buy the green energy. And that is one of my biggest scare for Korea right now. You only have 5% renewable energy in your electricity. So what is going to happen the day all the consumers want you to produce green? Will you have to stop your factories? Will you have to move them to Poland or US where you can buy the uh, green uh, electricity? Uh, that is one of my scare because of the push for RE100 is strong and it's moving really fast. Thank you. The ambassador, well, if he was not an ambassador, then he would have been a world-renowned speaker. I really appreciate your elaborate comment. Well, I understand the ambassador has to leave for another matter to attend to. When I was little, I'm now 60 years old, about 30 years ago. Well, there was such a catchphrase in Seoul, although Korea was behind in industrialization, but in terms of digitization, Korea will become number one in the world. That was the announcement and declaration made by the Korean government back then. And uh, Korea has always been a fast follower rather than a first mover. So it is very, it has been very good at imitating a great model. So the intensive investment by the government, as well as the sacrifice by the laborers in Korea, we have made such an accomplishment. But I think while there have been many points we can refer to for the direction that we can pursue as a nation, now the ambassador has to leave. So is it okay for me to well, address some more questions from the floor? Is it okay, for Professor? Please give, them, give him a big hand. 
since the ambassador has on in has to leave right now for the matter to attend to. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now, the chairman and the professor will continue the Q&A session. Well, this is such a rare opportunity for me to ask questions to the ambassador as well as to the professor. Now, I'd like to receive questions from the floor. I don't, don't quite see people. If there is any question, well, please uh, raise your hand and introduce yourself before asking the question. Somebody raised a hand, the second row. I think you are from the U.S. Council, right? The Council here uh, for the U.S. Consulate. Two questions. Uh, one is related to the opening of the Arctic routes. Uh, of course, Busan, uh, one of its main livelihoods is, is shipping, second largest transshipping uh, port in the world, six or seven in terms of container volume. So I think that's going to be very, very important. It was off to the side, off the map. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just uh, speak on that briefly. And then secondly, as we contemplate this massive shift in a relatively small amount of time, uh, what can the developed world do to the uh, growing, expanding, and uh, part of the world that's becoming wealthier and having uh, greater transformations? How can the developed and developing world work together to make that transition smoother, more sustainable, more profitable, and have those allocation of resources be the best possible. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for your, your questions. On the first one, um, so Team Pusan has one advantage, which is, as you mentioned, that is the latitude is uh, relatively uh, high. So in other words, um, for transshipment in particular, uh, it is much better located than any harbor in Japan or in China, right? Uh, because it is closer to uh, either the Northwest or the Northeast Passage. Um, I would perhaps uh, speculate that only Vladivostok in Russia has a better location, right? Um, so that is in principle something that could help um, the harbor here. Uh, especially in terms of um, uh, container interchange and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so the second question is a, is a tricky one, because as you know, uh, the world in which you and I, and I think everybody else here were born into, uh, which was essentially the world that came out of the settlement after World War II, um, is really no longer there. Right? And the institutions that we created at the end of World War II, especially economic institutions to ensure collaboration and cooperation in the world, are, are a little bit outdated um, because the emerging world, uh, the um, least developed parts of the world don't have as much representation there. And uh, that, has, that's, that situation, that reality has, has become a point of contention. Uh, but I would argue um, something even more, more important. Right now, what I think is we have a deficit in terms of dialogue in the world, uh, in terms of um, forums such as these, which, of course, uh, can be virtual if the, if the pandemic doesn't allow them to be, to be um, you know, in person, face to face. Um, I don't think uh, the major players in the world, United States, China, European Union, India, and so on and so forth, are having conversations as frequently as the major economic powers used to have in the 1980s, in the 1990s, right? So I think there's a deficit from that perspective. Uh, and more, more importantly, I, I also strongly believe that the two largest economies and also technological powers, China and the United States, that they really need to understand each other and look for ways to collaborate and co cooperate because otherwise it's going to be really difficult to run the economy, um, the global economy, because it's not just the United States. When the U.S. was confronted with the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union really didn't, you know, play a role in the global economy. 
um, but uh, China does, right? And so that is, I think, uh, also a, a very strong requirement. So what I think I would, I would uh, propose is that there is more um, collaboration, more exchange of perspectives and, uh, and points of view, and that at the end, you know, all parties, especially these bigger economies, are willing to compromise on some of their agendas so that we can move the economy forward. And in particular, we can address the, the challenge of climate change, which, as you know, right now is um, or has become uh, difficult to um, you know, implement global solutions precisely because of the lack of agreement between some of the big players in the world. So, the, regarding this question, Professor Guillen gave us a very clear answer. But my impression is that there is a thing like image. You know, the developed countries, uh, for hundreds of years, they built, they had the prosperity. But China claimed that long time ago, uh, China was the most prosperous nation, and today it is now actually emerging as one of the G2. And many advanced countries feel that the wealth is now transferred to emerging market. So if the pandemic happened 20 years ago, as you mentioned, you said that the it's, I think that the hundreds of or millions of people may have lost their life, just like the Black Death that you talked about, or the Spanish flu. So, and you also talked about the Arctic issues and its implications in Busan port. You also talked about the need for dialogue. And Korea, I think, is too small to play any kind of role here, but And Korea, we do have a significant imbalance and gap and between the rich and the poor. And also there is a global gap between the advanced nations and developing countries. But I believe that the advanced nations could show some generosity, then it can actually um, create wealth for everyone. So. Once again, I would like to thank the Professor Gien for his great message uh, delivered to this World Ocean Forum. And I'm very sorry that we do have time constraint, but maybe if the future opportunities allows, I would like to invite Professor Gien again. Uh, so thank you very much for your time once again. <laughs>